since this is now DroidCon and Linux time, who of you guys is from Linux time? Okay, there's a bunch of you. Hello. <laughs> and I guess the others are Android users, I hope at least. My name is Tim Messerschmidt, and I'm running the developer evangelism team for PayPal in Europe. So that means me and my colleagues, we run to conferences like this. We give interesting, hopefully interesting tech talks. We work with the SDK teams, we run hackathons, and we are hopefully the guys that you contact if you run into issues with PayPal. This is not going to be a product talk, so please don't run. And as Heinrich already mentioned, I have this really internal hate for passwords. And I think it's justified. I really believe it's justified. It's basically my nemesis. And I want to start with this really, really simple uh, question. Do you actually believe in security? Anyone believing in security? One? The only positive guy in security. <laughs> You all hear about it all the time, right? It must be super secure. So let me restress that. Do you believe in security? Well, I don't. And I want to start my talk with a little story about passwords. There's this really cool site called Security. It's it's not really a hacker group, but it's also not really a consultancy, it's something in between. And what these guys do? Thank you. I have a pointer now. And what these guys do is they analyze passports every time a big company gets hacked and those passports leak. So they go over those lists and see what are actually popular passports. Uh, passports. So what do people do wrong? So I guess the first passport on this list is quite easy to guess. Okay. For that certain person of all users on this really, really huge list, use the password, password. That's, oh my god, I'm like, who does that? If you do that, please leave this room. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> it's okay. I'm giving advice how to change it, buddy. Alright, so you see, this is about, I'm not sure if that was 4%, but, but <laughs> alright, let's continue. Um, it's not going to be much better though. 8.5% of all users are super creative and they go either for password or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, to be very, very clear and honest, that's not so much better. Nearly 10% are really, really creative because you know all those password fields asking you for an eight-digit password. So let's add two more digits, right? That's making it really secure. And it doesn't really even stop here. It's really, really bad. 40% uh, of all passwords end up in the top 10. 40% um, are being covered by the top 100. You see the same with top 500 and top 1000. It's really bad if I have a password that's being covered by this top 1000. And it's so easy to guess, I should probably change it, right? So the first time I really saw this statistic, I kind of looked like this, like, oh, oh my god. <laughs> and we all don't want to look like this, especially if another company gets hacked and you see your account is in there. So I believe that people change, I believe in change. So I checked up the results from 2013 because Guy Security, the last list I had on there, was roughly 2011. So let's assume people change and people learn, right? Let's hope so. Well, <laughs> they don't really. Um, there's actually some fun things to see in there. Adobe got hacked last year and their passwords leaked. And you see top 10, Adobe 1 to 3 made it in there. Also we see number 15, Photoshop. So their products are popular. <laughs> it really speaks for them. And I also like to speak about um, the eternal hate of people for monkeys. Because monkey went down from position 6 to 17. 
Who doesn't like monkeys? Sunshine went down, so people seem to be more depressed. It's, I don't know what's going on, but we really, I think everybody in this room would agree this is really horrible. And people obviously behave more like this than they should. So they come up with really funky passwords by just not thinking about what they should actually do. So, I have a few learnings over there. People hate monkeys again. I think that has to be stressed over and over again. People are more depressed, that's what I said, and the lobby is extremely popular. Now, going a bit away from that, then let's be more serious. Um, I think the three main problems over here that everybody has to face is passwords are being reused. So that means you shouldn't stick for the same long, even secure passwords, because if it gets linked one, at once, it's not usable anymore. Go for random passwords for random sites. Passwords are being fished. There are so many cool companies that enable you to send emails. It's so easy to spoof an email address. Please be aware. And obviously, pair passwords are being keylocked. People have all those funny tools that collect your data. So probably think about what you enter. And every now and then, maybe run a mail can who saw Lord of the Rings in the first part? Lord of the Rings, anyone? Who remembers the scene of Moria where Gandalf tried to get in? There's this amazing Abstruse Goose comic. And what they basically say is Gandalf is running a dictionary attack on Moria. So he stands in front of the entrance and what he does is he goes like, ABC, Abracadabra, blah 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 blah, and at some point he gets to the word Melon, which is Elvish for friend. And yes, I had a really, really bad uh, childhood if I don't know these things. But basically, if your password is really easy to guess, just don't go for it. Also, Star Wars, I love Star Wars. Did you ever wonder what Arto Leto does if he goes to the Death Star and manages to open the doors and use the tractor beam? Obviously he has root access, right? So you see over here another abstruse news comic. If you don't know that site, I highly recommend it. It's really funny. And uh, Arto Leto obviously just uses his cool uh, gas passport on the and controls the Death Star. So probably don't just think to secure your passwords on the front end, think about back end. And the last but not least is, before I get rid of this, I hate password thing. People always say that a really secure password needs to be secured by having lots of funky symbols and numbers and characters and it shouldn't contain a word because that works for dictionary tags and Right, like there's all those things that you hear over and over again. And explicitly, another great site, they come up with this comic basically proving that correct force battery state is actually more secure in terms of how fast can you brute force it than Troubadour and Free. And yeah, probably needs each. But you get the fact it's actually easier to remember and more secure. So why don't they come up with site-specific normal words that I can remember. Or I stick with the tools that help me. There's one password which I really love. There's KeyPass, LastPass, there's a bunch of different tools that enable you to have secure passwords without having that in mind, which really helps. And there is this quote that I found in Smashing Magazine, which is rather a web development magazine, but I mean, Web best practices usually work quite nice in the events as well. And they say if you pay for security too much over the user experience, users are going to have a really bad time because you have to pay to use. So what else can we do? We cannot force users to have really long passwords. What else can we use to make sure that your users enjoy using your app? One thing that I saw, uh, which LinkedIn does, again, this is with data, but the same it happens in more and more apps, is why don't you enable the users to see their inputs? So even if you have user accounts and you have passwords, why don't you enable them to see what they just entered? There's this cool thing called Newton heuristics, which is really, really open. 
but what it basically says is never not use input unless the user wants to. So vice versa would mean you can mask user input but enable users to show what they just entered. Because we're not speaking about this MacBook I have over there or like a normal keyboard. We talk about the guy having his phone in his hand, walking around that they are probably sitting in a queue and typing things in with a touch screen with tiny tiny characters. So please make sure that this guy doesn't have to enter his password five times if it's a long, secure and random password. Make sure you can actually log in. I think that's quite convenient and it's very easy to implement. Now talking about basic authentication, um, you see it has its pitfalls because people have to think about passwords and usernames and all that stuff. But what can we do to help users that these things don't get needs? Well, first of all, we need to think about storing them securely, right? And there is this big issue that you saw on Android for quite a bit that there was nothing like the iOS screen uh, key shape. So there was not really a central place where you could store uh, data that was nicely encrypted. There were all features that basically Android delivered over time by having hardware encryption that you had to turn on. But to be very honest, lots of people don't have it turned on because it resets your phone, it does a factory run. And clearly there is now alternatives. One came with the account manager in Android for free, which is the key store. And one is a database based on SQLite, which is called SQL Cypher. And that's basically a free encrypted database that you can use to store usernames and passwords securely. So obviously you still need to hash these things and things, but if somebody manages to extract the database or gets access to it, you are not screwed and your users are not screwed. So I can highly recommend that. It's really, really nice. And it's far better than going for shared preferences. And I see lots of people still using their apps with shared preferences for user details. So please think about using SQL Cypher or now the account manager to handle these things. So I'm standing here on stage and I'm kind of trying to be very important and meaningful. You might think so much, right? Like, why do you tell me these things? I don't really care. For some reason there is an empty slide over here. <laughs> It's very, um, it's something where I have to use it something. But going for something else, um, people forget passwords. So we have this big issue that 45% um, of survey people from Boeing is a consultancy, the graphics types, 45% of them admit it that they would rather leave your website, and that applies also to your app, than resetting their passwords or answering security questions because lots of them don't really enter valid data. How often did you sign up for a new service and instead of entering something useful, you just type a funny email address in there, like through that data, or you answer the security question wrong, and then at some point you want to use that service and you don't know your password and you cannot really read that. So that user's gone is not really helpful for you anymore. And 657 users again were surveyed, and 66% of those guys thought it might actually make sense to go for social signing. So let's speak a bit about social signing, login, Twitter, and all that stuff. But before we do that, who saw this recently in the media? Thank you. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. And um, we are all talking about Heartbeat. It's a vulnerability that got discovered in the OpenSSL uh, stack in a certain version that was kind of popular because lots of services used it. And April 7th, this got publicly disclosed. People found out OpenSSL is not secure, at least not in that version. So, to give you a good impression of what happened to this, um, that's actually my uh, PayPal inbox. I got an email from LeapMotion saying my password is not valid anymore, I have to reason it. I got something from Slack, which is a cool Slack, uh, chat tool. I got one from my number one task manager, Wunderlist. I got one from IFTT, and it went on and on and on and on. All those passwords that I thought of before, 
that hopefully were random anyway, got leaked possibly. Nobody knows if they really got leaked or not, but they, if they could have been leaked, they are basically compromised, so you should change that. And I'm pretty sure everybody in this room got at least two or three of those emails as well. Or otherwise, your services you are using are not really honest. So, that leaked again, much more laws for one password. People came up with at least kind of tiny helpers that help you getting this stuff fixed. So, one password has this tool too, uh, that you find at heartbeat.com. There is much more things going on. So, obviously, we all can get over it. But why don't we just get rid of our passwords? I think the first few minutes of my talk so I already proved there is kind of an issue with passwords, and it doesn't really help every time that they get compromised that we have to generate new ones. There must be something better. So what can we do instead? Right? That there must be something. So the first thing that I like to talk about is usually passwordless authentication. There's this really, really interesting blog post on medium.com which goes into things like SMS and email authentication. Everybody of you nowadays runs around with a feature phone, with a smartphone. Some of you have two in my pocket, I have three right now. Everybody has this mobile thing that receives either text messages or emails. So why don't we try to leverage these? So we go into things like two for effect authentication. There is cool applications and services like Authy and Google Authenticator that help you basically generating short lived tokens that give you access to your services without really compromising something. Because if you get my Google Authentication code from three minutes ago, it's not valid anymore, I don't really care. So why don't we all start using two factor authentication? So give me a short raise of hand if you have enabled two card effect authentication in your Google account. Who didn't? Why? <laughs> so please think about enabling it. It's something that lots of services offer, Facebook, Dropbox, Google, eBay, and lots of companies offer it. Please go forward and use it. There is this website, twofactorauth.org. They have this great overview of different services, which authentication they use. It's definitely something that helps you be more secure and protecting your data. Now to go a bit more into this direction, effect authentication, does this also go into all company? I think so. So let's talk about the difference between authentication and authorization. Authentication usually means I give you basically access to resources of mine. That doesn't mean that I really identify myself. I'm still anonymous. You don't really have to know that it's Tim standing in front of you. You just know I'm the paper guy giving you access to my slides as an example. Twitter does that with well, uh, Facebook does that with Warp too as well. There's all those services you can make more of, right? But then there's authorization, which means this is really me. It's a message me. I want to identify myself. So being anonymous obviously has its advantages because sometimes you don't really need to know who I am. If I just want to use your service in combination with my existing accounts as a password substitute, let's say substitute. So all of one. Ah, so much love for all, right? The final draft of all of us kind of finished in 2007. But the two companies like Google and Yahoo have been working on it and it used to be quite nice, it used to be good and it really helps companies like Twitter to grow. But for most developers that are being faced with implementing all, I see three systems coming up. They run because they are really scared. They cry out of disparity. Or they are getting really, really, really angry with the product managers. So probably, probably, Prolog has its issues. Whoever worked with Prolog and implemented it client side, who enjoyed it? See, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So to give you a kind of impression how Prolog works, 
we have two sides, the service provider, which is the central service that we're leveraging, and the consumer, which is your app. So your app requests this request token, it gets a token granted, then it gets redirected to get the authorization by the users logging in, then we get another redirect to get an access token, and we kind of exchange this token again, and then we finally have access to resources. This is what they call the lower funds, and I really started dancing, so I'm not really good at that, but some people don't like this. So, then there is this for on A, and people always wonder what's going on with that film, or where's the difference between one and one A. Simply put, it's the same mechanism, but there used to be a bug that got found in all one and allowed people to change the redirect URI. So that meant, after the user authorized your app to use the service, somebody could drive a man in the middle attack and get the token. So the user logged in thinking it's your app and somebody else got the token. So what they did is they kind of fixed it by um, changing the uh, address and moving forward. But to be honest, lots of the issues like it's really bad to implement didn't really get resolved. So it was more like putting lipstick on a pig. And to be honest, the whole thing felt kind of like Indiana Jones in the temple of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he has to exchange this idol. So he has this bag of sand and the golden idol that he wants to get. So he tries to change the implementation, but it's really clunky, it doesn't really work, it doesn't feel good. You see he looks really stressed out. So there must be ways to help us. What's our setback? I don't know, is Matthias Kepler in the room right now? From SoundCloud? No? Shall we not? He's here at the conference. I saw him. He should have come. So, Signpost, the library that Matthias wrote, is amazing. It's the probably best of one library that you find for Android. It's open source. Matthias kind of discontinued working on it, but since it's open source, other people fixed it and picked it up and worked on it. So, if you ever, ever have to work with Core One or One A, Take a look at Signpoint. It's really helpful. It saved my life for me. Now, there's this thing we call two, and it's actually much better. I like it much more. So there was a focus when they sat down to draft this new thing at IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force. And what they did is basically publish a new framework, which came out in 2012. So instead of having lots of funny things that you have to set up and timestamps and all that stuff, you have one header that's called the Verito that you pass and that's your optimization. So they removed two steps from the eight step of dance and made it very simple to use. So there's this instant redirect to the service, the user logs in, he gets this optimization token, and then he requests the access token. So it got so much easier to use that it's, I wouldn't say it's not to implement but it's at least doable without fighting into your um, table and putting your head against the wall. It's actually really good. But even for that, some people prefer using libraries. So this is the simple version. Just setting up a URL connection or whatever you use to actually communicate. And you set a request property for the header, which is authorization, there, and then the talk. Or you can also pass it for most implementations if they use the standards via the URL parameters. So super easy to use, people get around it, no libraries really need it. If you want to use libraries, there is Scribe, which is pretty cool. And then there is um, Postmanlib, which has this really horrible URL, but it's actually quite nice to use. So Scribe handles all the OAuth talk management. And Postman sits on top of Scribe and does the whole web view, you log in kind of thing. And that works really nice. And if you have ever worked with Google Play services, you will notice that they use for two in the background as well. So off to is kind of nice, it works. Right now there's no way of exploit really saying it's horrible. So I think we can stick to it, right? Again, there's this one guy sitting in the corner and saying, no way. So Aaron Hammer, who used to be one of the main contributors, said, go off to and he wrote to help. He felt so angry about all 
that you published this blog post saying, these are the 10,000 things being wrong about the world. I kind of overview this, um, but he basically just said, we are all trying to focus on being simple and clean, and then you guys all came up with tens of thousands of different scenarios of people often case. Coffee machines with a Twitter account, your freezer, your phone, your Tesla, probably, all those kind of different devices and scenarios how to log in. So he says there must be something else that we can do, and he kind of actually left the application scene now, and he works at Node.js, which is a cool project as well. Um, but it seems like he was really, really sad. Well, also there's this identity techniques, OpenID, OpenID Connect and Persona. OpenID used to be around for a long time. Google actually used to use OpenID a lot. But now it's really almost gone. There's this site, myopenid.com, which used to be a central hosted identity in the internet. And a company named Genray kind of hosted it and worked on it. But now this year they discontinue it with you because OpenID is really horrible to implement, it's not fun at all, people don't enjoy it, and nobody uses it anymore. OpenID Connect is something that sits on top of OAuth and tries to clean up OAuth, make sure people use OAuth for the whole authentication part, and authorization handles it through as a, basically happens through a certain layer. And Persona, lots of people probably heard about browser ID or web Persona, is something that Mozilla uses right now. So the idea is again one decentralized service that is being used to authenticate. Right now it's not decentralized because Mozilla didn't find anybody who wants to like pick up the service. But the idea is there's lots of different Persona accounts hosted by different sites. And basically, even if one side gets compromised, there's lots of other sites. Nobody really uses it, except um, Mozilla has this really cool Everpad kind of group. And then we have to think, if we talk about identity, OpenID, OpenID Connect, OAuth, is there a difference in all those IDs? I think there is. So we see two things coming up right now. One is being called the social identity, which is obviously your social networks, Facebook, Twitter, uh, probably Google Plus. And we see concrete identities that might be your bank, your state, and all these kind of guys. And if you look at countries like Lithuania, they actually have a state issued open ID. That's pretty interesting. Now, we face all this issue that on the internet everybody can pretend to be anyone, right? So why can I not pretend to be this guy? But obviously because I have a history in my network. But usually people don't tend to share everything about their self. They share their holiday pictures, they share that they just had amazing food in this great restaurant, but they may not share that they don't feel well or something like that. So we don't really have a complete identity, we just have a part, usually the optimal part, about somebody. So do we always use the same identity? Obviously not, because there is a different service of life. Should we? Well, since all those services might be a security issue, obviously not, again. And we should usually think about, does this app really make sense for Facebook, or does this really uh, make sense for PayPal? If you use a social app, Go for Facebook, right? But if you go for maybe a delivery service, leave a bundle probably, you might want to go for something that has more valuable data in it. So that's four identity products that I consider interesting right now. Google Plus, again, you see it very much in the Android world for some reason. You see Facebook coming around, they just talked about anonymous signing at the end of the eight, in a lot of reasons. PayPal has a login mechanism, and Twitter, obviously. And all those services have some kind of reason to exist. So if we talk about data, is your friends list interesting, or is it rather details like the date of birth, creation date, your language, and all these kind of things that identify you. And if you require user data details in your application, if you pick one of those identity providers, or probably multiple ones, think about what benefit do you have from that? Which data do you really want to use? Or is it really just to log in people? 
And one thing that I really, really hate is going to Play Store, downloading an app that I probably didn't use before, and seeing the loading thing first before I can use anything in my app that I just downloaded. If I download an app and I don't get a preview of what you actually do, I don't see which features you really offer, and I just have your really short description, I probably leave your app, go to my home screen, and uninstall the app. So don't use uh, identity and don't use login as the kind of artificial pens around your application. Use login to customize user experience and to maybe do something like history. So something that really adds value instead of just making sure you get user data. So what's actually next? Because all those things are still around, right? So I like to talk about Bluetooth Smart, which some of you might know the, as Bluetooth Low Energy or Bluetooth 4.0. And there's a bunch of other cool things. So one thing that uh, I really like is fingerprint readers, biometric. So I have this really cool sensorless pipe over here, and I can unlock it by sliding my finger over it. Same happens to the iPhone 5 or whatever it calls it, Touch ID. Obviously, now we come down to the discussion, is the fingerprint a password, or is it my identity? And what happens if somebody compromises my fingerprint by getting access to the encrypted data? So obviously, I just have 10 fingers. So hopefully that doesn't get leaked too often, right? So we shouldn't use that for any service and for anything. We've been using it together with uh, Samsung to handle payments that are usually low value. So imagine if you go to a Starbucks and you get a coffee. It might be okay to obviously just slide your finger and pay because it's five euros you don't really care. But if you go to a media market and buy this new shiny Sony television or something like that, and it's more than a thousand euros, you probably want to go a bit further and add more security, because users would be really unwell just letting their thing at that city. It feels a bit too good, a bit too easy. So obviously there's also other things. Um, we have running the PayPal I mentioned it earlier, that enables stuff like um, what we call future payments. So I can actually agree on logging in once and giving access to certain services without re-logging. So in our case, it could be simple payments. And that's usually what you in Germany might know as Bankeinstuhl. That's the same kind of thing. Instead of giving your uh, guy with your flat your check every month, you give him this agreement once that he can charge you every month a certain amount that you agree upon. So these are kind of services. Do I always have to uh, have computers logging in, or do I just need that once in front of this data? And then we go in further. Uh, have you ever anyone saw 90 already? 90? Okay, there is a bunch of you. 90 is a wristband that uses your heartbeat to identify you. So why don't I use my heartbeat, which is unique to myself, to identify for simple things, simple tasks? Why don't I skip the login by just pressing a button on my 90? And then there's this cool new alliance called FIDO, which stands for Fast Identity Online. And it's a corporation and uh, basically a big group that's being tied together by Microsoft, by PayPal, by Google, by Lenovo, by lots of big guys. It's finally decided it's time to change things by having one standard for different kind of devices. And they want to go heavily into this thing of biometry being something else. So we can add security dependent on the use case, instead of saying it's always the same kind of password. So I might require your long password for more secure things and for more important things, and I might require your fingerprint for something not as valuable. And that really helps people be more flexible. Now, Looking at what we have, for me, this is really this big need for one big, finally usable authentication framework. And going deeper down the road, I just have to say, security doesn't have to matter to users as much as to developers, because you should make it easy for your people to be secure. So even if they don't really think about passwords, 
we shouldn't help them to be secure. Because we just learned. People don't learn as fast as we require them. Heartbeats affected us, and we all learned that it's really terrible, really bad. But I don't think my mother really read about heartbeats. She probably read that and she thought, well, did it, I don't care. There is a big difference between authentication and authorization. So think about which users and user service you use and why. And don't compare user experience by being too secure. Enable users to see what they enter. Enable users to change data easily. And don't make it really complicated by having this really freaked out password rules. I think it's time for us all to stop hiding. Really cute cat, and I think it's really to start to start time to take action. So think about enabling user experience. Think about going, getting rid of passwords, and start using services like SendGrid or Twilio to send out emails and SMS for people to log in. Generate unique tokens instead of long living tokens. Make sure that people are secure, and I think it's up to you, developers, actually helping them. We do have an event coming up, Google Hack in Berlin. If you're around, join us, it's a cool hacker fun. And I'm really, really hoping for some good questions. Thank you.